What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. Because Jesus is the key to joy. Um, if you would, grab your Bibles and open up to the book of... That's right. We're in a verse-by-verse study through the book of Philippians. What book are we in? Philippians. Okay, just making sure. Philippians chapter 2 today is where we plan to be. Um, you know, our series title is ever so simple, but ever so simply profound. <sighs> that Jesus is the key to joy. Jesus. He's the key to life, the key to hope, the key to love, the key to peace. But he's also the key to joy. And this morning, as we spend some time in God's Word in the second chapter of the book of Philippians, we'll kind of consider, I guess you could call our time together if you were to entitle it, Learn and Live by Example. You say, why do you say that? Well, hang with me. Well, I'll share with you. In Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 19, is where we pick up our time in the study of God's Word today. But before we jump into that text, just a couple other things by way of announcement that I want to make sure you know are available to you as a, look at it as a resource. Number one, one of our values as Christians, but specifically those that identify Coastline as, a, as our home church, is that we want to learn God's Word so that we can live God's Word just once a week. Any other would be way too much if we did it. Way, no, no, no. But we'd like to provide you with a tool, a platform, a resource to be reading through God's Word at least five days a week. You know, I found out something new this year that there's almost, almost doesn't mean exact, almost as many New Testament chapters in the Bible as there are weekdays in our year. Almost. It's a few more weekdays. But since January, we've been navigating a daily reading plan that will end in December through the New Testament. And then in 2022, which is next year, Lord willing, we plan to pick up our Daily in the Word series through the book of Genesis. Um, So if you're not following along in the reading plan, I don't know that you can go to heaven. I think you have to have this checked off. When Jesus says, why should I let you in? See, there's these little boxes here. He said, everyone's checked. That's why I'm here. No. The only thing that we look at is Jesus and his finished work and who he is. That's, that's why we go to heaven. But I think one of the great things, and we'll look at it today, about not having to live life on loop, not having to live in a rut or even to rot, but to revive every single morning comes from being in God's Word. Now, there's multitudinous Bible reading plans out there. If you're like, I need to read the whole Bible in a year, well, God bless you. Go for it. We're just trying to do a chapter a day, five days a week. But also, we've been blessed with a great communications team that you know, puts together handouts and even video accompaniment, devotionals, two-minute devotionals, from some of the the individuals on our staff from here in Gulf Breeze and in Destin and in Navarre. And let me just share this with you. This has been a game changer for my family because it was hard for us to navigate a good devotional platform that we could kind of adhere to for a three-month-old, for a three-year-old, for a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, I won't tell you how old my wife and I are. Well, I'm 40, and then there's my beautiful bride, who always has an anniversary of her 21st birthday every February 15th. That's how old my <laughs> wife is. But, um, but it's been a wonderful thing, because we're just able to turn on the Devo and just say, hey, what did, what did you listen to and what did you learn? And it's been such a formative thing for our little family over this last year. You, some of you say, little? Hey, I know some people have 12 kids. Can you believe that? But I'm not in a race. Let them win that race. You know, they, can, they can have that trophy. 
But all that to say, love for you to join us daily in the Word. If you'd like, man, I'd love to get the email daily. Just go to the Connect desk, see Regina or Pastor Joe. They'd love for you to have that in your inbox. It comes right around 6 a.m. every morning, uh, Monday through Friday. Or you can check it out on the YouTube or anywhere social media is. But um, just want to help, help you learn God's Word so you can live it. And that's kind of what today is about. Um, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, Paul is picking up this uh, kind of show and tell of what it looks like to follow after Jesus. But let's see if we can catch up from where we've been in this book. You know, Paul authored this letter to the church in Philippi. And if you're anything like Leonidas, Ulysses, Stephen Spencer, you would ask this question, why? Right? That's his three-year-old response to everything. Why? Why did Paul write this letter to the Christians in Philippi? Because he hated them. No, no, no. Because he loved them. He was connected to them. He cared about them. You see, he went to Philippi 10 years earlier and planted a church. And in fact, this church, the church that's in reference here to Philippians, is the very first church plant in Europe. Now, now most of us, that means, oh, we could probably trace our roots back spiritually, back to those who initially received this letter. It was an important church. It was a pivotal church. It had been 10 years since he'd been there, and now Paul is in prison in Rome. Now, if you had someone that cared about you that you hadn't seen in 10 years, and you didn't have social media to be able to follow up, well, how, what did they eat for breakfast that day? Like, you don't, you know, you can't see everything that's going on, but you hear that your friend, your, your mentor, is in prison, and your heart is still beating, there would be some sense of concern. Some sense of, is he doing okay? Does he need anything? And that's what was going on. The Philippians were a little freaked out that Paul was in prison. So he's writing to encourage them. Hey, I'm okay. I'm good. Spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally. I'm solid. I'm good. Well, how? Why? Well, see, this letter displays the joy that comes from being had by Jesus. That's what this letter is about. You see, having Jesus, there's an element of invincibility. Jesus promised, in this world, you will have comfort and pleasure forevermore. Let me read it to you. John 16, 33. I've said these things to you that in in me you may have peace, for in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You mean in this world we won't get everything that we vote for? In this world, things won't align perfectly with our worldview? Well, how dare the world treat me such? I'm a king, I'm a queen. I have my own castle that's got conditioned air. I have motorized chariots that take me wherever I want to go. I have food and entertainment at my beck and call. I live like a king. I should be treated as one. That's the culture we're in. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. Why? Because in this world you'll have tribulation. This is not where you're supposed to be be building your portfolio. Your heavenly portfolio is way more important than your earthly one. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So there is an element of invincibility for those who follow and those who have been had by Jesus. See, when Jesus has your heart, your heart can be an unsalable fortress. It can be. Can be. See, thus far, we've been learning through the book of Philippians, two of the four, let me say that again, two of the four, Attitudes, mindsets, choices that unlock this truth that Jesus is the key to joy. In chapter 1, we see the first one. It's this reality that a singleness of mind, a singleness of mind, when it comes to challenging circumstances, has anyone ever experienced challenging circumstances? Anyone born before 2020? Okay, so this is you. You've experienced challenging circumstances? 
How do you navigate that? A singleness of mind. That's what chapter 1 shows us. What do you mean? Paul is in prison. And you know what's happening? Christians are reveling in that fact. Circumstances, though, didn't rob him of joy because, listen to me, please, he's not living to enjoy his circumstances. He's not living for that perfect job description. He's not living for that fatty bank account. He's not living so that he can do whatever he wants to do with his time off. He's living to serve Jesus. Now listen to me. Hear me on this. Paul understood that he had a single purpose, to know him and to make him known. And for those that live that way, this is true, circumstances were subservient to him. He wasn't subservient to them. But that's not true for many of us. Because if we're honest, that's not our primary heartbeat. It's not to know him and to see him known. It's to know him and then make sure we get ours, right? So therefore, circumstances dictate your heart. Your heart is not that insalable fortress. It's open. Because life is lived for here and now. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. How do you know this? Because in chapter 1, he says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's this singleness of mind. So how are circumstances subservient to him? Because listen, whether it's high water or head high and glassy, he's good. Whether he's being abased or he's abounding, he's okay. Whether he's in prison or he's just riding free, here's his perspective. God will use this circumstance for his glory and the good of others. So I'm good. I'm good. That's how you win. That's how you endure. It's a singleness of mind. But this is not available to those that would say, well, I'm just looking for the get out of hell card. I'm, I'm honestly just looking to add Jesus to my agenda. To be honest with you, I want to do my thing and have God bless it. Listen, man, God loves you. He's so patient. He'll meet you right where you are. But if you want to experience joy on this side of eternity, peace, love, as it's meant to be, you can't say, Lord, let me tell you what to do. That, that doesn't work. Does that make sense? Like, people that say, Lord, don't also say, now let me tell you what you should be doing. That, that's like, you got the job descriptions messed up. You say, Lord, what would you have me do? Ah, uh, there it is. There's where life begins. That's what chapter 1 shows us. When you have a singleness of mind, circumstances, oh, they may impact you. Don't misunderstand me. You're still human. But they don't have to derail you. They don't have to. See, the second mindset, action, attitude, choice that we're learning in chapter 2 is about the submissive mind. If chapter 1 is about a single-hearted single mind, chapter 2 is about a, a submitted mind. And that's where we are today. See, in chapter 1, he's talking about difficult circumstances. In chapter 2, he's talking about relationships. And let me ask you a question. Another pop quiz. Anyone have challenging relationships in their life? This whole back section. Lord, save them. They're liars. All of them, right back there. Yes. Often the most challenging person in life is the one in the mirror, Right? Yeah, that guy knows. He's got a good mirror. There's this mindset that, hey, you know, not every relationship is like, man, I just can't, I just want to get burritos with that guy. Not every, not every situation is like that. And I'll be honest, if you're anything like me, self is king. Comfort is king. I mean, that's my flesh. Like, I, I want what I want. You know, like, who, who doesn't? That's normal. Do you know what's super normal, supernatural? Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, as he sets up this chapter. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? A rhetorical question would be, well, yeah, absolutely. There's complete encouragement from belonging to Christ. Any comfort of his love? Most definitely. The love of Christ is so comforting. 
any fellowship together in the Spirit. Absolutely, there's relationships that I have in the body of Christ that I can find nowhere else. Are your hearts not tender and compassionate? Haven't you changed internally because you're a Christian? Yes. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with one another. No. Right? No, I just want Jesus, the beach, and the Bible. That's what I want. People? Chapter 2, verse 2. Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with one another. Loving one another. Working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. If you were to look at chapter 2 and say, what's the point? That's the point. Because Christ is supreme, have a singleness of mind, chapter 1. Because Christ is supreme, have a submissive mind, to where you defer to one another. And see, then the rest of chapter 2, he gives four examples. He's like, here, let me show you what I mean by that. Number 1, verses 1 through 11, look at Jesus. He did that. He had a submissive mindset to his Father. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. But then last week, as Pastor John showed, Paul also said, well, it's not just our Lord that had this submissiveness of mind, but I'm trying to do that, Paul would say. If you look at verses 12 through 18, Paul is given as an example. But can you imagine like the, the readers reading that? And they're like, okay, singleness of mind, I'm getting that, Paul. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Got it, chapter one. Chapter two, you want us to get along, all right? So it's about a submissiveness of mind. And who do you cite as examples? Jesus and yourself. Those are like top shelf, Paul. How, how do I have, give us some examples that we can relate to. And that's what today is. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, we first look at the example of Timothy. In fact, it's in verses 19 through 24 this morning that we'll consider Timothy as one we can learn from by his example. And then in verses 25 through 30, we'll learn from this guy named, let's say this word together, Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. Yeah, that's one that you should do the YouTube thing for. How do you say this word? Epaphroditus. Today, we're going to learn from the Word of God how to learn and to live by example with Timothy and Epaphroditus as the example of navigating challenging relationships with a mind that is submitted to Christ. Father, I pray as we consider this this morning that you would illuminate the truth of your word by your spirit, through your word, to your people. Jesus, you said when the sower goes out to sow that there's different kinds of soil. There's rocky soil, there's shallow soil, there's the kind of the hurried, busy soil, and then there's the good soil. I recognize that out of all those that are here this morning or joining us online or perhaps listening at a later time, we're all in one of those camps. So I just ask and pray, Lord, for those whose hearts are open, that you would speak. They'd help me to get out of the way and that your word would do its good work. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. First example today, but it's actually example number three, is Timothy. Let me just read to you verses 19 through 24 and what Paul writes about Timothy. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by the news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him to you, just as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will come also. Remember the main point of chapter 2. Paul is urging Christians in Philippi to a place of unity, like-mindedness, love, humility, and service. 
He shows that Jesus was that. He says that in his own life, he's, he's attempting to do that. And then he says, now Timothy. Now here's the deal. Historically, we don't know a ton about Timothy. We do know that he's from modern day area Turkey, but that also that he was kind of religiously blended in his upbringing. His mom and his grandmother were Hebrews, Jews. His father was a Greek. So most likely he was raised with this kind of blended spiritual background. His father raised and educated him as a Greek. His mother and grandmother taught him the scriptures. And Paul and Timothy, they first connected, first met. It's recorded for us in Acts chapter 16 when Paul, right before he heads to the area of Philippi, where he's planting this church. And here's the dynamic between Paul and Timothy. There was a like-mindedness there. And even here in Philippians 2, Paul says, I really don't have anyone to send to you who could serve so selflessly as Tim does. See, while Paul is in prison in Rome, there are those that are capitalizing on his predicament, attempting to steal his influence and, and trying to become the next capital A apostle, right? Like, oh man, Paul's having a hard time? I'm going to get in there and get his job. But Timothy, do you know what he was willing to do? He was willing to serve. He was willing to see that the vision that God had given Paul for it to be realized. Timothy wasn't about him. Paul said, Timothy is the only one who is like-minded, cut from the same cloth. So I'd just like to share maybe two things that we can maybe learn from Timothy's example. Number one is more of a statement. And here it is. Timothy was a soul man. You know that song? I'm a soul. We're not going to play it. Don't worry about it. But when he says in verse 20, I have no one like him, in the original language, the idea that the Greek language gives is that we're of one soul. Like we emote the same. We feel the same. We think the same. We, we kind of like, we see it the same way. You have people like that in your life that maybe you haven't connected to, maybe they're long-distance friends or something, but when you pick up the phone or you see one another face-to-face -face or whatever, it's like, man, we're right back where we started. This is awesome. We both like those same kind of Cheetos, you know, like whatever the silly thing is. There's just a sense of like a soulish connection. He was a soul man. That's who Timothy was. He's faithful, flexible, and focused on serving Jesus and Jesus' people. Let me say that again. He's faithful, flexible, and focused. And Paul says, that's my people right there. That's who, that's who I am. Faithful, flexible, and focused. On what? The bottom line. How can I make more green? No. Faithful, flexible, but focused on serving Jesus and his people. John MacArthur says this, Timothy was of great use to Paul because Timothy was willing to do anything that Paul wanted him to do. Paul could send him somewhere, and, and this is the rock, he would go. Paul could take him with him, and he would travel. He could leave him somewhere, and he would stay. No objections. It's like Paul is saying, I can trust this guy. Like he's, he's faithful. He's flexible. And he's focused on serving Jesus. In Paul's experience, the guy who authors the New Testament, you know what he says about that? These guys are rare. Says, Honestly, I can't find anyone else other than Tim who's like this. Most are not faithful. Most are not flexible. Most find it challenging to stay focused. I'm a most. Anyone else a most? Like, pff, I have the spirit inside me. Yes. But I also have the flesh, the devil, and the world around me all the time. So do you. 
If anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. And we see the example. Faithful, flexible, focused. How? How do you get there? We'll talk about that in a moment, but in Paul's experience, a guy like Tim was rare. Most were kind of doing their own thing in the name of Jesus. I think it's a scary thing to build your name on the back of Jesus. It's a scary thing to platform yourself in a community that belongs to Jesus. And instead of building his name, you're actually building yours. There's a lot of that that goes on nowadays. It's a scary place to be. But you know what Timothy did? I'm going to show up and serve. That's what I'm here to do. It's like Count Zinzendorf. It's kind of funny, this quote that's attributed to Count Zinzendorf. You're like, who in the world is that? Well, if you don't know who that is, then that's good. But there's this quote that he has that I thought was funny that's still attributed to him because he says, preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. And that's what he's remembered for. It's like, oh, well, you were remembered. Anyway, but that mindset of show up and serve and serve. See, it takes courage to be a leader, but it also takes courage to be a follower. Timothy knew that there can be no leaders without followers, and so Timothy carried out Paul's vision faithfully. Can I tell you something that my dad used to tell me when I first started opening the Bible to explain it? He said, Neil, if you're going to teach the Bible, here's what you need to know. You are not the teacher. You are one learner amongst other learners helping us learn the Bible. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. The platform that you may be on is a platform to serve, not to be seen. That's what the gift of teaching is for. It's for serving the church, not to be seen by the church. That's not what this is about. We're all servants. Who's in charge? Jesus. It's his church. The rest of us? Like it's like that, I think my dad used to tell us this illustration of like a finger in the bucket of water. And like as soon as you take that finger out, it's like, oh, organizationally, I believe Jesus can bring any of us to do the jobs that we do. But relationally and personally, there's only one of you. I love that. God wants to do what he wants to do in Mr. Rep, what he doesn't want to do through Bremer. Bremer's unique. Right? From Venezuela? Is that where you're from? Yeah, Venezuela. That's unique. Anyone else from Venezuela? No. Unique. Unique. What he wants to do through Troy. What he wants to do through Randy. Through Jeff, through Lee. God has a unique plan for your life. But in juxtaposition to that, he also doesn't need you to get ministry done. This is what's so beautiful about walking with the Lord. It's like, man, I'm vital, I'm important, I'm valued. But the focus is Jesus. He's the king. The rest of us, we follow him. And this is what Paul would say about Timothy. There's just not a lot of people that see it that way. And he says, I, I can send him to you because I can try. He, he's got it, his focus on Jesus. He's faithful to Jesus. And he's flexible to do whatever Jesus wants him to do. The statement is this. Are you a soul man? I don't take that like, oh, no, I'm a girl, so I don't have to pay attention to that one. No, the question is, do you see ministry that way? Well, no, I'm not in ministry. Your life is ministry. It is service to something or someone. Is it faithful? Is it flexible? Is it focused? You say, no, maybe that's why you don't have joy. Maybe. See, the statement is, man, being a soul man, so to speak, is just saying, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm surrendered to you. What you say is what I say. But then here comes this question. Here's the second thing we could maybe learn from Timothy. Do you look for Timothy? You say, what do you mean? Well, Timothy, often in the scripture, is referred to as Paul's son in the faith. Kind of like a father-son love, but also kind of an apprenticeship mindset. He was investing in Timothy for future ministry. And and I believe we're called to do this with our life, to be someone who gives out what we've got. Have you ever heard of the 10 steps to joy? Let me share them with you real quick. Step number one, you might want to write all these down. I know it's going to be 10, but it's going to be okay. Number one. Do something nice for someone else and then repeat that nine times. There it is. That's the 10-step process to joy. Do something nice, kind, thoughtful 
for someone else and then just repeat that nine more times. And you'll find, man, I, uh, there's joy. It's not about me. It's about others. It's about others. See, here's the deal. Invest in others. Invest in others. This can take on many forms. Like an older woman spending time with younger woman. Just allow that individual to see how you lead your life by example. Like investing in the kids' ministry, the student ministry, the skate ministry. That, that's a way that you can invest your time. You know, it's amazing what's happening in our kids and student ministries. Last Sunday, there were 24 fourth graders in the second service. And I was like, oh, that's trouble. That's a lot of kids. And then I talked to the individual. His name's Scott. He goes, oh, I got it. 24. We got it. I was like, well, yeah, we got it, but like, it'd be nice to see more investment there where more hands, you know, to see more people value children in the way that they're cared for and taught and served on a Sunday morning. There's wonderful opportunities on Sundays with a student ministry. The individual who runs that, his name's Todd. He goes, Neil, we're, I'm so thankful for the building, but it's just, we've already outgrown it. You know, there's already like almost 100 junior high coming on first service. And high school's competing with that. And by God's grace, there's 24 to 25 volunteers that serve in that ministry. But I don't know if you've met a teenager nowadays. Like, they're in a challenging culture. Like, it's hard to do ministry one on 100. Does that make sense? Like, you kind of need it like one on maybe two or three to be able to build relationship and invest. Let me ask you a question. Are you looking for Timothy? Did you even know that you needed to be? Because God has entrusted gifts, talents, abilities, knowledge, and wisdom that shouldn't stay with you, but that should flow through you. And that's where joy comes, investing into others. One of my Bible college professors once said this thing, and I thought it was helpful for me. He said, Neil, Maybe your problem is God gave you a blessing and you hoarded it. Thinking that the thing that God blessed you with was meant for you to enjoy. He said, you're blessed to be a blessing. You're resourced so that you can resource others. You're given gifts and talents and abilities so that you can serve others, not be served. That is countercultural to an American way of thought. Perhaps that's why the American culture is one of the most oppressed cultures. Because it is so blessed, but unto themselves. You're blessed to be a blessing. You're there to invest in others. Where is the Timothy in your life? Who are you investing in? See, Jesus modeled a lifestyle of one who poured his life into others at the appropriate time. And that's the key. 30 years, kind of quiet, you know? Not much going on. Working with his you know, dad's business, maybe. But then when public ministry came to Jesus, he didn't hire a PR firm. He invested in 12. And then really invested in three. There were thousands that came. But he modeled this lifestyle for three years of just investing in others. Investing in others. Should you always be investing in others? I'm going to say this. I think you need margin in your life. You have to be invested in two so that you can invest in others. And if you're always giving and never receiving, well, that's not good. There are limits. Did you know that? Like there's speed limits. There's checking account limits. You know that? Like, oh, there's only so much in there. There's also limits on mental capacity, emotional capacity, relational capacity. It's okay to recognize that I need margin. I can't be Paul to everybody. Who's God called me to invest in? Follow the Lord. He'll show you. And you've probably got someone in your life that likes you, like a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister or a coworker or somebody. They can give you feedback. Hey, you're, you're doing too much. And then Paul, as we close this morning, gives us his fourth and final example of what it looks like to live with a submissive mindset. He's referenced Jesus our Lord in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. 
He's referenced his own life in verse 12 through 24. I'm sorry, 12 through 18. And then in verses 19 through 24, he talks about Timothy. And here in verses 25 through 30, he looks at Epaphroditus. Look at what he says in verse 1. And if you're still with me, let me know by saying Jesus is the key to joy. Okay, verse 25. He says, I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier and messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Epaphroditus is sick. People care about him. Indeed, he was ill, near death, but God had mercy on him. And not only him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. You mean Paul had anxiety? He was real. He was human. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor. Such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Man, what a guy. Paul gives this wonderful description of Epaphroditus. He says, he's a brother, which means he knows what it's like to be in the fellowship of the gospel. He's a companion in labor, which means he's kind of tied to the furtherance of the gospel. And he's a soldier, which means he knows how to endure. He knows how to fight for the faith of the gospel. You know what this says of Epaphroditus? He's centered. He's balanced. One author writes this. He says, Some Christians think of only fellowship, the brotherhood, and have no time to win souls for the fight against the enemy. Others are so wrapped up in service that they forget fellowship. This was the mistake that Martha made. Still others are always fighting so much that they neglect fellowship and service. We need to be balanced Christians balanced Christians. How do we stay balanced and centered? It kind of goes back to that question that we were considering when we were looking at Timothy. How do you get there? Here's my opinion. I think when you receive the gospel, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that that alone brings new life. That beautiful truth That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. When you place your faith in the finished work and in the person of Jesus, that brings brand new life. Nothing else will. The gospel brings new life. And then I believe as we begin to engage in spiritual growth, We bring balance to that life and growth and development and health and nourishment, growing in the Lord. See, you're not saved just to be shelved. You're saved to grow, to have that new life be something you actually live and enjoy. Well, this is one of the ways, by getting good nourishment daily, by being in His Word. By allowing your lifestyle, like it says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, become a a living sacrifice unto Jesus, where everything, heart, head, and hands, is surrendered over to Him. That's where life begins to be balanced and be centered. But, But let me see your eyes. You're not meant to do this Christian thing alone. I do think you need to receive Jesus individually. Personally, did you know that Jesus has no grandchildren? Just children. You don't come to know him because mom and dad did. You've got to do it. And did you know that it's not really on anyone else's shoulders for you to kind of like grow in your walk with the Lord? The Holy Spirit does that in collaboration with your will. But did you know this? That you're meant to gather with God's people to worship and love and adore him. I think you should do it weekly. It's just an opinion. You're just getting the NIV right now. Neil's interesting version. This is what you're getting. I believe the gospel brings new life. I believe growth brings centeredness and balance. And that's something you do privately with the Lord. There's got to be a personal relationship. But I also think that there's this beautiful dynamic of fellowship. Well, how do we do fellowship? 
gather what you're doing right now to sing, to give, to learn, to pray, to fellowship, to break bread and communion. If you'll do that weekly, I believe you're investing in your spiritual health. But it doesn't stop there. Not only is it about the gospel in growth personally, but together, it's about gathering to love God. It's about grouping to connect together. You know, it's amazing. Pastor Joe Prestridge sent me a report earlier this morning. He sends a report every week of how the connect groups are doing. And it's interesting to see that number just keep going up every week, where there were 235 people involved in connect group this last week. And I look at that and go, Lord, that's amazing. Your people are gathering to worship and they're grouping to connect. That, that's a pathway to health. See, because it's in those connect groups where you build relationships, where you can begin to not just hear a Neil monologue again. It's like he hits play on a chest, like a, what was that toy from no, Teddy Rupskin or something? But like, you begin to grow together. And then thirdly, with the community, you go to live on mission. You gather, you group, you go to love, connect, and live on mission. That's how you stay centered, balanced, together. See, Epaphrodites, he was someone who loved people. But as Paul mentions here, listen, he's someone who is a brother. He knows what it's like to have fellowship in the gospel. He's a companion in the labor. He knows what it's like to work towards the furtherance of the gospel. And then he says he's like a good soldier meaning he knows how to battle for the faith of the gospel. Epaphrodites loved people. He loved people. And as Paul says here, he was sick and almost died. Well, look at what it says there in verse 29 and 30 of Philippians chapter 2. Receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete that which was lacking in your service to me. Someone once said this, we need more Christians who are more burdened not only for foreign missions, but also for their local church. For their local church. Because by definition, a local church is a mission in that community. That's why it's there. To see that community reached with the gospel. I mean, I'm so stoked that the point is open. Anyone heard about the point in Tiger Point? That's awesome. That's called like a country club. That's not this. Like, that's not what a church is. A church isn't a place, well, man, let's just get it to make it awesome. How many screens can we get in this place? How many? No. This is a mission. This is a family. The body of Christ. And Epaphrodites and Timothy knew, man, we've got to give our life to serve God's people. We don't want to live it for building our own portfolios. What's that going to do for us? Let's build up others. Epaphrodites loved people. He was a blessing to Paul. He was a blessing to the local church. And in light of all this, this is what he says. Man, receive that guy when he comes with joy. He almost literally gave his life for your benefit. This morning as we close, I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team up as we begin to close out our time in God's Word this morning. It's my hope and my desire as we consider this second chapter of Philippians that we learn by example of these individuals, but also that we live by example. Does that make sense? Like What, what Paul's doing here in chapter 2 is he's showing, listen, when it comes to Timothy and Epaphroditus, these are some examples of how you can live with a submissive mind unto Jesus. We want to learn from example, but we also want to lead and live by example. Jesus is truly the key to joy. And in chapter 2, you see some examples of Jesus himself, Paul and Timothy and Epaphrodites and how they lived. But I think this is interesting. You know, keys are an interesting thing. Not only physically do they open and close things, but symbolically... A key can be the difference between freedom or incarceration, life or death. Jesus is the key to joy. Jesus is the key to salvation. Jesus is the key to life, 
to hope, to meaning, to purpose, to community. Jesus is the key. So here's the question I would say as we close our time together this morning. How do we move this from words on a page to a heartbeat in our souls? How do we move this from words on a page to a lifestyle that impacts our our personal families, our local communities, our local church? Sometimes the key makes the difference between freedom and incarceration, between life and death, and Jesus is the key to joy. He's the only way. But here's the question. But give me, how do I, how do I step into that? How do I know him and practically walk with him? Perhaps you remember this little acrostic from a few weeks ago when we opened up the book of Philippians. Key. K-E-Y. Know, engage, and yield. What do you mean? Hear me on this. God loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die for you. If your faith is in Christ, please listen to this. You're forgiven. You're set free. You're part of the family of God. And you have a future that is being made without hands. It's beautiful where God has you going. Know that deep in your bones. Know that his ways are better than any other way. That God's word, his commandments are God's enablements, not God's bummers. Know the truth. Know the truth of the gospel. But number two, you have to engage with that truth. Jesus' half-brother, James, said even the demons believe and tremble. So then that must mean there's a difference between belief that saves and belief that doesn't. Yes, there is a difference. Belief that Jesus is Lord does not save you. Belief in Jesus is what saves you. And you're evidencing that right now. If we were to say, hey, we're going to have time for church. Why don't you guys grab a seat and go, I don't know that I have belief that that chair can hold up this body. I really like this body. I don't want this body on the floor. I say, no, 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 just have a seat. Then you sit down. Oh, I'm putting my belief in the seat. See, when you believe in Jesus, you're placing the full weight of your sin and your shame on Jesus and you're resting in him. You engage with him in that way. But also with these truths, if you're someone here would say, listen, I'm in challenging circumstances or challenging relationships. Are you walking according to the word? Well, no. Well, then that's where the disconnect is. You need a singleness of mind. You need a submissiveness of mind. How do I get that? I firmly believe that if you come to God who loves you dearly and you say, Lord, change me from the inside out he's going to zap you one day and everything's going to be perfect no 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 he's going to give you opportunities to trust him you may say lord help me and then things get harder why god's giving you an opportunity to trust him in difficult circumstances with difficult people when you don't know what to do do what you know to do okay i'm going to practice the 10 steps to joy one thing nice for somebody Repeat that nine times. When you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. You know to love God and love others. Engage with Him. And then then the why, yield. How do I yield? you, You know when someone's yielded. It's their A, B, C, and Ds. Attitudes, beliefs, choices, and decisions. Oh, that person's following Jesus. Look at the decision they just made. Look at that attitude. They, they've resonated in their soul that it's a choice to rejoice. But they don't wait for the emotion to put in the motion. They know that in following God, oftentimes you say, I'm putting the motion in, and God, I'll trust you with the emotions. I'm not here for that roller coaster. I'm here to follow you. You may say, I don't have that joy. I would ask you, well, are you using the key? The key's Jesus. Do you know him? Do you engage with him? Do you yield yourself over to him? You say, nah. Well, then that's where the problem is. But see, this is what I love about today. Today is always the day of salvation. Today is always the best day to follow Jesus, either for the first time or the one millionth time. Or you would say, man, Lord, I know you salvifically. 
I've known you. Lord, I want to know you as my Lord in every decision, in every attitude, in every choice. And that's where I would say, man, now you're on that path of submissiveness to Jesus. And that's where joy is found on this side of eternity. It's not found in the things that you have, in the positions that you hold, in the place that you live. It's found in Christ and being yielded over to him daily. Church, may I have your attention. May may I see your eyes. God loves you so very much. His plans for you are good. And as my dad would always tell us as kids, God has a plan for your life, but so does the enemy. And every day you're making choices about which plan you're going to follow. I want to encourage you. I want to exhort you. I want to entreat you. Follow Jesus. Stick with him. Serve him. Love his people. Because one day you'll be gone. One day you'll be done. And I, for one, like many of you, I I want something like Epaphroditus has. I want that, I want that resume. What, of perfect life? No, I want to be faithful. That's all I want. I just want one day to be able to stand before the Lord and say, okay, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's what I'm living for. Everything else is ash. Everything else is like, it's here today, gone tomorrow. But Jesus, living for him, is the only thing I've found that endures. Everything else fails. Everything else. But Jesus is so good. He's so faithful. There's nothing else and no one else that can be. He's the perfect one. So I want to encourage you. I want to entreat you. I want to exhort you. To know that Jesus loves you and to yield yourself to him. Please let go of that which does not provide what it promises. Only Jesus produces that joy. Only Jesus produces life. Surrender to him. Let go of your ideals, your passions and pursuits and just follow him. And I really do believe you seek first the kingdom of God. Let him take care of everything else. And that's where joy is found. It's not through a different zip code. It's not through a different job description. It's not through a different marital partner. It's not through a new hobby. It's through a centeredness in Jesus. Epaphrodite's got it. Timothy got it. Paul got it. I know you can get it too. If those guys can get it, so can we.